Well, hello, my name is Javier Ruiz. I'm an associate professor here at UPC, and I will talk to you a little about uh, 3D and 3D and deep, le deep learning. So first of all, I would like to thank to two of my students, Belen Luke and Abe Pujol. Some of her material I have been using for this talk, so let's say thanks. And uh, this is the outline of the talk. It's going to be brief, but I will start with the motivation, why 3D is important. Mm -hmm. And then I will talk a little bit about point clouds, which is the most common representation of a 3D uh, structure. Then a little bit about uh, 3D data sets that can be used for deep learning. Some deep learning considerations, of when to use point clouds and how to use point clouds within a deep learning framework. Then some of the techniques that the literature has been uh, using uh, for uh, integrating uh, point clouds into uh, deep learning and then some conclusions at the end. Uh, so let's just start with the motivation. The main motivation for you know, using 3D is that new sensors have appeared, which are cheaper, uh, smaller, and with more resolution, basically Kinect structure or, or prime sense. And this has allowed for new data sets to be created. No? And as soon as uh, new data sets are created, then you can think about doing some learning on, on it. And then, on the other hand, there are several applications, uh, mainly virtual and augmented reality, that uh, involved this 3D representation. Now, you know about this uh, virtual reality that you immerse yourself in a 3D environment. So the 3D data, it's starting to be common because of these data sets, and important because there are applications that involved uh, 3D. Uh, so then, Point cloud, it's a, a common representation of a 3D structure of a scene. Okay, a point cloud, it's a collection of data points uh, given on a, on a coordinate system. They usually represent the surface of objects. I mean, you can have it uh, here represented. And mainly, they use the, the, the Cartesian coordinate system. No? So if you think of the Cartesian coordinate system, at the end, a point cloud is just a list of an ordered x, y, z values. No? For each of the points in this uh, point cloud, you have the x, y, and z coordinates defined, defining the location of that point in the uh, in your world, no, on your space. Uh, understood? Of course, you can have. I mean, these three coordinates are mandatory that defines the point cloud, but you can have extra information, no? So you can think that for each of the points, you can also add, for instance, the color, no, the RGB information of that specific point, or the orientation. You, know, you, you can add a normal information, normal vector information of, in each of these points, or the curvature, etc. No? So you can add more information to this list. The list is the, the minimum. Okay. And um, okay, just so you know, I mean, the point are not only the only representation of a, of a 3D information. You can have some others. One of the common ones is meshes. A meshes is like a a, a more complete representation. No? With point cloud, you only have points defined. With meshes, you have the points, but also the faces. No, so you you define for for each of the points, you define the neighborhoods of these points that create a a face. No, and the minimum points that you need to create a face, a plane, is three points. So every three points, you define a face for that point, okay? And there is a mesh, no? You have here an example. Okay, me meshes are better representations than point clouds in the sense that point clouds, you have holes in it, no? I mean, you, you have only information of the point. So within the points, you don't know what it is, no? It's, it's just an empty space. And if you think about it, with a mesh, I mean, you have a face between these three points, and then this is opaque, no? You, you have the information for the entire space. Yeah, clear? Having said that, um, I will focus on point clouds in this talk. You know, it's the basic one, and people have started using point clouds and not that much measure. So let's go back, let's say uh, that we will play with point clouds, and the use of meshes is more or less straightforward in this, in this framework. Okay? As I said, I mean, the, the, these new sensors have uh, allowed to the appearance of multitude of new data sets, okay? So 3D data sets. I just want to mention a, some of them that I found quite interesting, and they are mainly used in the literature. 
And as you will see, I mean, they have a peer data set for almost every task nowadays. No? So we have some data set for classification. So for instance, this one gives you the 3D information on several objects, classified, so you can use it to classify objects. Also for post estimation, so this data set it gives you the 3D information of the object, but also how it is posed within the scene, no? if it's uh, the orientation and the uh, position of the object within the scene. So you can uh, use this data set to learn to classify objects, but also locate them in the scene. Oops. Also for segmentation, I mean, they have up here data sets for outdoor scenes, so you have an outdoor scene, 3D information of the outdoor scene, and uh, labels saying what kind of object it is. Now, I mean, if it's an outdoor scene, I mean, you get labels like uh, floor, walls, buildings, etc. But also indoor scenes, so you have data sets which uh, classify objects that you can uh, find in an indoor environment, like a sofas, chairs, etc. Also in, oops, so you need uh, permit to see this video, uh, that's okay. Uh, it seems related to autonomous driving. Autonomous driving is a, uh, an application which is very, very uh, interesting nowadays. But there are data sets which incorporate 3D information to this data set. So basically in urban scenes, you have the 3D information. This, this was just a video with the 3D information of, a, of an urban scene. So similar to this one, but taken from a car, basically. And then finally, there are very, very large data sets, you know, they, they say like a, a scene understanding. You know? Not only the objects are classified into uh, classes, but also the a scene layout is given to you, the pose of the objects are given to you, and I want to highlight uh, this last one. I think this is it's very important. It's used a lot. It's a, a huge data set of 3D information. It's uh, about six areas with over 6,000 uh, square meters, all annotated. And all the objects are annotated and located. And you have the 3D information, the orientation of each of the points, and the classifications of the points. So, Again, no. Uh, the application was there, virtual reality. <coughs> Sensors allowed for a lot of uh, data sets. Now it's, it was time for using uh, point clouds in a, a deep learning framework. Okay. So some considerations are about using point clouds in a, a deep learning framework. Okay. There are several challenges uh, for using point clouds. I will mention three of them. There are more, but at least the three most important ones, I think, are these ones. Okay, the first one, if you have an idea of a point cloud, you have to see that the neighborhood is undefined. No? On the left, we have an image, well, some, uh, an image of three by three, nine pixels. And if you select a pixel, maybe in the middle, the neighbors are fixed, no? The connectivity gives you the neighbors, no? You have a neighbors up, which is this one, and down, left or right, if you use a four connectivity, so the neighbors are fixed. If you think on a point cloud, uh, it's not that simple, no? I mean, you have points which might be close or not to the points that you want to analyze, and you have to explicitly define a neighborhood. Maybe you say, okay, maybe I define the neighborhood by the Euclidean distance to the point, which makes sense, no? But then, even though you have some problems, no? Because you can select this point, and maybe the closest one, it's on the ear, but the closest one's on the torso of the rabbit, no? And, and maybe this one, it's uh, at a further away distance, but it belongs to the same object, which is the ear, no? So in a point cloud, the neighborhood is tricky. And another challenge is that, related to this one, eh, with the neighborhood, is that the lattice, no? The lattice means that in, on an image, the pixels are structured. No? You have rows of pixels which are very structured. No? But on a point cloud, we ha you have not. And this is a problem mainly with convolutions. You know that convolutions are uh, used a lot in deep learning. No? We have these convolutional layers. And on an image, you can define a 3 by 3 convolutions here in a square in red. And this is very well defined. So you use nine pixels and you can move it. But if you try to define a convolution in a 3D space with point clouds, well, you have these problems of the neighborhood. And this way that you can define a 3D convolution, no? a cube instead of a square. But again, no, you have empty spaces where no points are, and then you go here and you have a lot of points. 
and it's difficult to define. You, you see this? Yeah. So it's something to to overcome. Okay. And then lastly, again related, is the difference in density. No, you have uh, spaces in the point cloud when there are no points, spaces where you have a lot of points. That really depends on the sensor that you're using. But what usually what happens is that for all of the sensors, is that objects which are closer to the sensor have more points, more density that objects that are far away from the sensor, no? which makes sense. And again, this is tricky, no? because if you define a convolution that you have uh, locations on the 3D point class that you have a lot of information, and then you have locations which you don't have that amount of information, and you have to deal with it. Yeah? So what are people what are the techniques that people are using to overcome these limitations? Okay, and basically I have selected you four of them. So the first one I will I will go one by one. Eh? But the first one is uh, okay. Let's not use directly point clouds. We will use somehow a, an information of the of the three D structure, which is a depth image, and then the normal RGB image. So a combination of RGB plus depth. This is this D, which is also called two point half D. Not 3D, but more or less 3D, 2.5. Uh, okay. So that one, I will talk a little bit about this, and then the other solution will be okay. Let, let's voxelize. No, you have a 3D space, and you can voxelize, discretize the space. And instead of pixels, you have voxels, 3D, and then you use voxels, which the lattice is defined. Or you can project. So you have the three information, the Mario in the middle, and then you project this information into several images and then you use the images and finally you can say no 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 I'm, I'm very stubborn and I want to use 3D point clouds as an input of a deep learning uh, network and then you can use this uh, we'll talk a little bit how you can use this okay so let's go one by one so we go fast okay the first one was uh, okay n not using the 3D point cloud but let's use this RGB and depth images this is very common no? in the literature this is uh, very common maybe you have heard about this in the previous uh, talks basically what I think is that some of the sensors use this as the raw input no? the sensor captures the RGB image captures a depth image and then from this builds the point cloud. Okay, so it's it's basically a good idea to say, okay, I won't use the point cloud. I will keep using the raw data of the sensor, no, which is the RGBD. And again, eh, there are multiple applications for this, multiple uh, networks using RGB ballastic. Just want to say two things. The first one is that uh, okay, the straightforward solution will be okay. Then I have a depth image, so I will concatenate RGB plus depth. No, and my image will be a four-channel image instead of a three-channel. And I feed the network, and that's it. And that is the straightforward. It's okay, but uh, experiments have shown that better results are obtained if you use like a two-stream network. So you use RGB to train a sub-network, depth to train another sub-network, and then you uh, do the fusion at the end. Okay, this is basically. If you think about it, it makes sense because the idea is that. The RGB and the depth, they are heterogeneous in nature. They have different information. So it's better for the network not to be trained on the RGB and then another way to be trained on the depth rather than mix them together. Okay? And the, the idea is that once you do this uh, fusion at the end, results are better. Okay? And you can check this link that uh, explains this uh, very well. Yep, understood? So that's the RGB. Let's move into voxelization. The other idea is, okay, we have the point cloud. It's a structure, so one thing we can do is discretize in a space. No, we discretize in X, Y, and Z, and instead of having pixels, we have uh, 3D voxels. Okay? So it's a, like a mask of the image, but a 3D mask. It's, a, a, it's called a voxel occupancy grid. No, it tells you if that specific uh, voxel in a space was occupied or not by this uh, structure. Okay, uh, and then you feed this to the network. And you can use this. This is a structure, but that's nice. The only thing is that it's a 3D volume, so you have to use 3D convolutional layers, not 2D uh, layers, but 3D. And, and maybe the problems in this case is that, of course, it's difficult to obtain a, a voxel site that works for all your applications, no? And, and also the memory requirements increases, no? Because you both supplies the space, you have to keep information for the empty spaces, and then multiplies the, the memory that you need. Okay? Uh, but yeah, I mean, people use it. I can show you at least two examples of this. 
Uh, they are very common. The, the first one is the, the 3D shape nets. It's a network uh, proposed by Vu in 2015. Uh, okay, here the input is at the bottom and goes up, and this one the input is on top and goes down. I mean, there is not a clear uh, nomenclature here. But, but the idea is this one. Eh? Instead of using the point clouds, they do a discretization of the space, and then they use 3D convolutions, and then are fully connected at the end to, to do the classification. Eh? And box and it's similar. No? They, they have the point cloud, the voxelize, creating an occupancy grid, and then they do 3D convolutions and fully connected layers to, to obtain the output. So some consideration about this. Uh, let, let's talk about the projection and then and, and I'll tell you. Okay, the projection, the projection is another idea. No? It's instead of having the point cloud, instead of voxelizing, let's project into one or more views you know, and use the projected images as the input for the network. You know? So here you have the example. Right? Instead of using the point cloud in the middle, you will use the images around it. Okay, and you can use one or two. I, I can give you some examples here. Okay, for instance, one example is somewhere we are doing here at UPC. It's about correspondence matching. No? So you have two point clouds of the same scene taken from different angles, and you want to locate points which are which correspond to the same uh, 3D object. No? For instance, you want to locate this point and this point as belonging to the same object. Okay. And again, you, you have two point clouds, you don't want to use the point cloud, so one idea will be, okay, I, we project, you know, we select one point in the point cloud, we project it into the principal plane, and this projection creates an image, and then we can compare two images. We do this with the two points, and then we can compare them. No? And that is the idea. Yes? We do this for one point in the point cloud, project into an image, this is the image obtained, we do the same for the other point, and then you train a network to tell you if they are correspondence or not. No? At the end, it's a binary classification that will tell you if they are the same uh, 3D point or not. No? But the idea that I want you to uh, get is that is the projection. Eh? Instead of point cloud, we'll use a projection. And again, you can extend this. No? Instead of one view, you can create multiple views. So this is a multi-view convolutional network, network proposed by Sue. Is that instead of using the 3D information, you project into several views, and then these views you fit them to normal uh, convolutional uh, networks, okay? And then you combine them at the end, and then you do the classification. So now, the, what I was talking about, experiments indicate that this multi-view projection is somehow better than voxelizing the 3D point cloud, okay? Uh, for instance, I mean, they, they, they did some experiments, and the accuracy in object classification for the multi-view networks was somehow better than the uh, voxelized ones, for the volumetric ones, okay? I mean, people say that doing this multi-view captures better this uh, rotation invariant of 3D point clouds, okay? I have to also say that, of course, new architectures are appearing that are closing this gap, no? For, for instance, they, they actually propose a network, instead of uh, voxelizing and, and a single network, they voxelize at different orientations, and then you fit all these networks and pull in, and this class prediction is much closer to this multi-view representation. So at the end, what, what they are saying is that if you incorporate this multi-view aspect into the voxels, they will also behave uh, correctly. The network will, will learn. Okay. And I'm going to finish uh, soon. Uh, the last one is uh, being stubborn no? and saying, no, 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 we want to use point clouds. How can I do it? No? Uh, is it possible to use feed point clouds into the network? And people are starting to propose architectures that work. Okay? I want to mention to you this one. This is PointNet, presented in uh, 2017, so uh, really, really now. And they propose a network which inputs a point cloud, and they use it for classification and, and semantic segmentation. So actually it works in many different applications. And the network that they propose is this one. I don't want to go into the details, but the idea is that the input is directly this X, Y, Z list of points, okay? And maybe the two clever bits is that they have this, uh, they have this transformation here. So they learn the transformation to be invariant to this uh, rotation, translation, and the scale. So, so they, they're invariant, so they, trying to replicate the idea of having this multi-view representation, so it's invariant. And then they, they do another transformation, so they try to be invariant to these problems of an another set of lists, no? that the list can be ordered in, in any, in any uh, place. 
and with this, I mean, it, it works, and they presented some results, and they are really close, if not better, than that the state of the art. So, so I will say that it's a, it's a nice way to follow uh, the state of the art. Okay, and that's it. And my conclusion is that uh, remember, no, point clouds is uh, a representation of the three structure of a scene. Uh, working with point clouds in a deep learning framework uh, has some challenges. And then the techniques are at least these four ones, no? to use RGB data, uh, to voxelize, to do projection, or to use point class, but you have to be clever in that sense. And that's it. Any question? <laughs>